Free news. Next, on Lectures in History, American University lecturer Aaron Bell teaches a class about privacy laws and federal surveillance of civil rights leaders. He describes the mid 20th century creation of the counterintelligence program, often called Co Intel Pro, and their tracking and infiltrating of domestic political organizations. His class is about 45 minutes. Well, welcome to class, everybody.、Uh, today we're going to talk about history of government surveillance.、Um, and the sort of central question I want to think about today、um, is can intelligence agencies operate in a democratic society and be successful in protecting the government and its citizens while also upholding those same citizens' rights, right? especially the right to dissent? Um, in other words, are liberty and security compatible? No doubt,、uh, there is a need、uh, for intelligence communities to operate.、Right? Threats exist from foreign and domestic sources. Those threats are real. They've been real throughout U.S. history, and they can come from across the political spectrum.、Um, but for over a century, in addition to taking action against real threats、uh, to the lives of American citizens, bureaus and agencies within the United States government. Have surveilled those who have expressed、uh, what the Cato Institute describes as, quote, strong political views that run counter to the prevailing government political paradigm.、Um, this challenges the notion often expressed by those who support a surveillance state of some sort、um, that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. And I'll want to come back to that later on、uh, in our class discussion. Now, maybe you really adhere to that view. Maybe you have. I'm kind of on the fence about it. Maybe you firmly reject it.、Um, that's fine. We'll have an opportunity to discuss that later. But the history of abuses in domestic surveillance in this country、uh, necessitates that discussion because the same tools that can be used to protect citizens、uh, in a democratic society, again, from legitimate threats,、um, can also be turned against those same citizens、uh, for less noble and even nefarious reasons. If you really want to look at the sort of history of surveillance in the United States, you'd go back probably about a century、uh, to 1908. Teddy Roosevelt's Attorney General creates a special squad of investigators to work on behalf of the Department of Justice,、uh, becomes known as the Bureau of Investigation, and then by the 1930s, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI.、Uh, the FBI's own history, if you go on their website,、um, They have a pretty long narrative description of their history, and they link the creation of an FBI to the progressive movement that is really active at that period of time at the turn of the century.、Right? The progressive movement,、um, it's sort of the sort of belief that undergirds it is that the federal government must intervene to foster justice in an industrial society.、Um, right? It's a response to the sort of labor unrest、um, that we've talked about in previous classes and everything that went along, right, that inspired that、um, terrible kind of working conditions and so forth. So the progressive movement inspire, inspires things, for example, like the FDA, right, to ensure that the food you're getting、uh, is that, right, has, has labels and what you're eating is actually what you think you're eating.、Um, right, it'll eventually lead to things like child labor laws,、um, but it will also then create this, this、uh, sort of nationwide. Um, law enforcement body、um, that is able to keep tabs on criminals throughout the country that did not exist prior to this period in time. The FBI's history explains, again, this creation、uh, based on the need for a professional law enforcement agency in the face of labor conflict, a rise in violent crime and corruption, both in politics and in big business,、um, all of that you know, accompanying urbanization and industrialization at the turn of the century. Um, as well as national security concerns,、uh, particularly regarding anarchism,、right? what the FBI, on its own description, describes as the first modern day terrorists,、um, as well as threats of wartime subversion and espionage, which we talked about、uh, the other week when we talked about free speech. In 1909, the FBI makes its first efforts to infiltrate political organizations,、uh, beginning with the Socialist Party of America. By the mid 1910s, they're investigating anti militarist and anti enlistment groups. And over the years, the FBI will spy on a variety of organizations, including the American Civil Liberties Union,、uh, the Evangelical American Council of Churches, the American Jewish Congress, the Nationwide Labor Federation, the AFL CIO, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Ethical Society of Philadelphia, the New Orleans Women's Center, the American Friends, American Friends Service Committee, which is a Quaker social justice organization, the Women's Peace Movement, led by Jane Addams. Pro labor, anti war folk singers like Pete Seeger, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes these 
people and organizations are investigated for decades. Um, these are not violent revolutionary threats, right? but rather political dissidents who oppose certain aspects of U.S. government policy um, and perhaps even the particular form of government that we have. But they do so through specific means, ostensibly protected under the Constitution, though, as we noted in our class on free speech, not so much right at the turn of the century when um, anarchist and leftist thought is strictly policed. Political spying will begin right around 1908, 1909, and will run until about 1924, and then will stop for about a decade. Um, and the impetus to stop it is what's known as the first Red Scare. Immediately after the First World War comes to an end, right, November of 1918, that following year, November, uh, 1919, uh, sees a number of actions that um, will raise a lot of concerns about government surveillance. Um, the Seattle General Strike in the early part of 1919, um, right, shuts down that city. Tens of thousands of workers go on strike across industries. Uh, in the spring of 1919, a bomb plot is broken up. Um, and then there's a wave of bombings in the summer, uh, anarchist bombings targeting prominent people, including the Attorney General, Alexander Palmer. Uh, his house is down on R, about R, and uh, right before you get to the kind of main circle there, or R hits Massachusetts, I realized at some point that that was his house, and I've been driving by it for years. It's super weird. Um, the Bureau of Investigation creates this thing called the Radical Division to sort of deal with this right, resurgence of, of anarchism, Headed by a young agent named J. Edgar Hoover, um, it compiles files on roughly 200,000 individuals. The Bureau then uses those files. Those files are then used to round up several thousand suspected radicals uh, in a series of raids in 1919 and 1920 that occur in at least 40 cities across the United States. Some of the people who are rounded up are, are well-known prominent radicals. Um, the anarchist Emma Goldman, who is a Russian immigrant to the United States, other people are arrested simply because they appeared foreign, uh, were members of a, a labor union, and so forth. Many of those arrested were held incommunicado for months, no access to lawyers, no access to their families. Uh, and 249 resident aliens are put on a boat and deported to Russia at the end of 1919 because of their alleged anarchist and syndicalist beliefs. There is a tremendous political backlash against this, in particular because right, a lot of these, many of these people who, who are rounded up, again, they are not engaged in radical, violent behavior. Um, they instead are, are political dissidents. Now, maybe they hold very radical views, um, but right, nonetheless, um, right, they have not exactly engaged in anything. And some of them are simply right, immigrants, um, immigrants from Russia, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, so the political backlash against this brings the FBI's political spying to a temporary halt. Um, this is made especially palatable to those who are in power and may have been inclined to support this kind of roundup at first, um, in part because of new immigration quotas that are put in place in 1924. These quotas restrict immigrants from Southern and Central Europe, um, totally shut down immigration from East Asia, which we'll talk about next week in the context of talking about Japanese-American internment. Uh, 1929 sees the end of a 10-year-long intelligence gathering program run by an organization known as the Black Chamber, because they have picked a more nefarious name. Uh, this is made up of people from the State Department and Army Intelligence. Essentially for 10 years, starting in 1919 and running until 1929, U.S. telegraph companies like Western Union had provided the Black Chamber with incoming and outgoing cable traffic. Um, this is shut down by Hoover's, by President Hoover's incoming Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, right, not to be confused with J. Edgar Hoover. Um, Stimson specifically opposed this spying on the U.S.'s diplomatic allies, not necessarily spying in general, but spying on the U.S.'s diplomatic allies, um, saying very famously, gentlemen don't read each other's mail. There's also a Supreme Court case at the end of the 20s that deals with wiretapping um, and weighing whether or not tapping into someone's, right, phone conversation, you have to imagine this is right early on in this period uh, where there are phones, um, does that violate the Fourth Amendment? Here's what the Fourth Amendment says. Uh, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. William Howard Taft, right, formerly President of the United States, then joins the Supreme Court. Uh, he speaks for the court's decision to um, 
basically rule against the, uh, the notion that wiretapping violates the Fourth Amendment. The court essentially approves this, and that approval will last for roughly 40 years. Here's what he says. Uh, again, this is in, in favor of ruling, um, in favor of wiretaps, claiming they don't violate the Fourth Amendment. Congress may, of course, protect the secrecy of telephone messages by making them, when intercepted, inadmissible in evidence in federal criminal trials by direct legislation. Right? If Congress wants to rule on this, they can. Uh, and thus depart from the common law of evidence. But the courts may not adopt, adopt such a policy by attributing an enlarged and unusual meaning to the Fourth Amendment. The reasonable view is that one who installs in his house a telephone instrument with connecting wires intends to project his voice to those quite outside, and that the wires beyond his house and messages while passing over them are not within the protection of the Fourth Amendment. Those who intercepted the projected voices were not in the house of either party to the conversation. Neither the cases we have cited nor any of the many federal decisions brought to our attention hold the Fourth Amendment to have been violated as against a defendant unless there has been an official search and seizure of his person or such a seizure of his papers or his tangible material effects or an actual physical invasion of his house for the purpose of making a seizure. A standard which would forbid the reception of evidence if obtained by other than nice ethical conduct by government officials would make society suffer and give criminals greater immunity than has been known heretofore. Um, so again, right, what he is saying here is that if you are using a telephone machine, um, it is connected to wires that go outside of the house and speak to someone outside of your home. And thus, someone tapping into the wire is not right, actually going into your house and searching your belongings. Um, right? that, is, that is outside of your home and thus does not fall under uh, the auspices of the Fourth Amendment. This is how the court rules right, in 1928. But I want to hit again on this last thing that he says. Uh, let me say it again. A standard which would forbid the reception of evidence if obtained by other than nice ethical conduct by government officials would make society suffer and give criminals greater immunity than has been known heretofore. Louis Brandeis, um, who in the 20s right, set the kind of standard for free speech in his dissent that ultimately then became the court's right, ruling many decades down the road, he dissented in this case as well. And here's what he said in particular regarding Taft's, Taft's last comments which are essentially, right, in some ways saying that the ends justifies the means. Um, here's what Brandeis says. Decency, security, and liberty alike demand that government officials shall be subjected to the same rules of conducts, conduct that are commands to the citizen. In a government of laws, existence of the government will be imperiled if it fails to observe the law scrupulously. Let's try that again. In a government of laws, existence of the government will be imperiled if it fails to observe the law scrupulously. Our government is the potent, the omnipresent teacher, for good or for ill. It teaches the whole people by its example. Crime is contagious. If the government becomes a lawbreaker, it breeds contempt for law. It invites every man to become a law unto himself. It invites anarchy. To declare that in the administration of the criminal law, the end justifies the means. To declare that the government may commit crimes in order to secure the conviction of a private criminal would bring terrible retribution. Against this pernicious doctrine, this court, court should resolutely set its face. Um, political spying ends from roughly right the early 20s until 1936, when Franklin Roosevelt requests that it be resumed. Um, what we'll see uh, very clearly here rise that government surveillance, again, it, it does not necessarily target any one particular group, um, though historically its targets have leaned left, not always, um, nor is it simply the purveyance of one particular political party or ideology. Franklin Roosevelt, right, the great liberal Democrat, requests that political spying be reinitiated in 1936. It will be led by our man up here, J. Edgar Hoover, appointed head of the Bureau of Investigation in 1924 at the age of 29, younger than I am. Um, Hoover had helped put together the list that had been used in the first Red Scare to round up a vast swath of people, um, but nonetheless he managed to kind of escape the political fallout of that, right, the, the sort of uh, right, blade came down on the heads of a few people higher up than him. 
And the Bureau had rebounded within that decade. Uh, Hoover had really tried to emphasize the Bureau's role as a crime-fighting organization, um, particularly in the 1930s when, during the Depression, you have this sort of some famous criminals that arise, people like John Dillinger that the FBI put a lot of work into capturing. Um, Hoover emphasizes this, knows how to kind of work the media in his favor. Um, the Bureau's rep reputation rebounds. Um, FDR is concerned, though, concerned about Soviet spies, and concerned about fascists. Right? This is the mid-1930s. Fascism is on the rise in Europe. Um, there are several U.S.-based groups that emerge after Hitler's rise to power and Mussolini's rise to power, right? large enough that the American Nazi Party can hold a rally in Madison Square Garden. Um, immediately after Adolf Hitler invades Poland in 1939, the FBI is authorized to investigate espionage, treason, and sabotage, right, all federal crimes. Um, but Hoover also adds to that list subversive activities. Um, it is unclear how much Franklin Roosevelt, how much his attorney general, people high up in the government knew about the extent of what Hoover would do. Um, there's no record of that particular meeting and what exactly was said in it. Um, and Roosevelt has bigger fish to fry in some sense, right, not knowing what's coming down the road. He's got an economic depression that continues to grind along. Um, he will ultimately have the war to deal with, but even prior to the United States century, right, that is like the looming specter of a renewed war in Europe. Um, but there's no sense that FDR opposed Hoover's intel work either. Um, Hoover renews this. Uh, his renewal of investigative uh, activities um, is authorized outside the courts. He discourages Roosevelt's administration from going to Congress to get legislative approval because he's sure he won't get it. Congress had actually um, been very suspicious of the Bureau of Investigation even being created in the first place, concerned about creating a secret state police force. Um, right? Hoover warns FDR that haters will twist the truth. Um, and so FDR proves political spying, um, the resumption of political spying without congressional approval. FDR supports Hoover's suggestion, which ultimately does not come to pass, to have every person in America fingerprinted. That was the newest technology at the moment. Uh, when the ACLU complains in 1936 about surveillance of pacifist groups, right, groups that don't want to go to war in Europe or trying to ensure that the United States does not become involved in anything that's about to happen over there, FDR responds in writing that he sees nothing wrong with investigating groups that spread, quote, false information and engage in, quote, false teachings. Uh, worth noting, his house had been bombed in 1919, and that certainly may have colored his views of political dissidents. Um, moreover, FDR has Hoover look into political opponents as well. In particular, he has the FBI investigate several senators uh, and several prominent public figures, including Charles Lindbergh, um, all of whom uh, oppose any intervention in Europe. Um, Hoover learns from this experience that he can curry favor and gain leverage by digging into any president's enemies, right, or perceived enemies. For example, he never blackmails uh, the Kennedy brothers, but he does give Robert Kennedy, right, attorney general under his brother's presidency, monthly updates on all the people that he knows, the accusations against him and family members. Um, and on the one hand, right, perhaps this is some helpful personal knowledge that uh, Robert Kennedy, right, can, can use however he sees fit, um, but it also ensures that the Kennedys know that Hoover knows, knows everything, knows everything that everybody is doing. So the Kennedys have the inclination to suddenly shut down what he might be doing. Um, they will know in the back of their mind that Hoover has tabs on anything that they've been doing. Um, the restoration of spying also takes place right in the context of an emerging national security state, one we're familiar with today, um, right when the Second World War ends, the Cold War begins shortly thereafter. Um, the House on American Activities Committee, right, which investigates suspected subversives, and the federal government's massive loyalty program uh, designed to snuff out anybody that might have dissenting political views. Um, all of those rely on FBI reports. In 1956, the FBI goes on the offensive uh, with the creation of COINTELPRO CPUSA, right, a counterintelligence program specifically designed to target the Communist Party uh, of the United States of America. It is specifically counterintelligence rather than prosecutorial, right? They're not trying to dig up evidence to go to before a court, but instead it's a counterintelligence operation to destroy a political enemy of the government um, for a couple of reasons. One, legal proceedings against Communist Party leaders um, 
had been very successful in sending a number of them to prison. The laws are very favorable toward doing that in this period of time. Um, but it had also exposed FBI informants. They had to go before a judge, reveal that information. And so well-placed informants were then revealed as part of the court hearings. Hoover's not real keen on that. Um, and in 1956-57, the court begins to roll back the legal measures that were available to attack political dissidents, um, laws that had been put in place in the late 30s and early 40s that had given kind of free reign to round up anybody uh, who's a member of a group that might espouse right, the overthrow of the United States government, um, which in court rulings was interpreted pretty loosely. It was used to put the sort of top leaders of the Communist Party of the United States in jail. Top leaders who, by the way, um, you know, are, are operating for a foreign party, um, CPUSA, its top leaders are controlled from Moscow. Its party line is controlled from Moscow, to be sure. Um, but this sort of rollback in legal power, the sort of threat of exposing more informants, leads to the creation of this counterintelligence program. Hoover's memo, creating COINTELPRO, calls for actions to negate the Communist Party's, quote, influence over the masses, ability to create controversy leading to confusion and disunity, Penetration of specific channels in American life where public opinion is molded and espionage and sabotage potential. All right, of those, the last two are illegal, espionage and sabotage. But influence over the masses, ability to create controversy, penetration of specific channels of American life where public opinion is molded, you may find the ideas of the Communist Party to be reprehensible. Um, nonetheless, right, those are not specifically illegal things. Um, the objective here is to destroy the Communist Party for its political activities. Um, Cohen Telpro is successful in doing that. It effectively destroys what remains of the Communist Party. Um, from 1956 to 71, there are 1,388 different Cohen Telpro actions conducted against the Communist Party. Um, its membership, roughly around 80,000. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, drops to maybe 1,000 active members in the 60s. Um, now, a large part of that is due to the legal measures that are used against the party. They also take a huge hit when, in 1956, Khrushchev comes to power in the Soviet Union and reveals that, in fact, um, all of the, the rumors about Stalin's behavior are totally true. He was a tyrannical monster who murdered millions, who conducted show trials um, of his political enemies and people he thought might be his political enemies. Um, right? That has a, has a huge effect. Uh, and turning people away from the Communist Party. Nonetheless, Hoover's obsession with the party keeps this going long past the point where CPUSA is relevant. There's actually substantial dissent in the ranks of the FBI in the late 60s because Hoover will not let this go, even though the party is well past the point where it poses any sort of remotely conceivable threat to the United States. Um, tactics for attacking CPUSA include leaking smear attacks to the media, planting evidence to suggest that party leaders are informants, right? Plant evidence and hope that someone else comes along and sees it and believes that their right, co-leader is actually an FBI informant. Um, creating a fake communist organization to attack the party from the Marxist left in order to further internal disputes, right? Communists are at each other's throats. Are you a Marxist or are you a Trotskyite? Uh, right, they kind of build, they create these fake organizations to create, to just like foster that kind of dissent. Um, my personal favorite of these, Operation Hoodwink, Send false documents to provoke a fight between the Communist Party and the Sicilian Mafia. The FBI is well aware of how the Cosa Nostra deals with threats. Here is the suggestion that they have uh, for how to deal with this. Uh, let's see. All right. This is an agent requesting bureau permission to prepare the following letter, anonymous letter, Xerox copies of which would be mailed to the same Teamster Union locals to the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, which were first sent the first anonymous letter. Here's the letter. Dear Union Boss, I'm the loyal union man who wrote you around the end of January, and I've got more news for you. You'll remember that I told you then that I heard from my commie brother-in-law that the leaders of his party had been in Moscow, and among the instructions they came back with was to try to get rid of the hoodlums and truck and dock unions in this country. Well, I was talking with my brother-in-law a few nights ago, and he asked me how things were going at my Teamster local, and I said, okay. 
He told me he knew that there were a lot of gangsters in my union, but he said things would be changing for the best shortly. He told me that in February, some of the leaders of his party were in Hungary meeting party people from other countries, and it came up again about how his party is going to clean up the gangster-controlled unions in the United States. I told him he was all wet, but I didn't use those words. I'm afraid these commies mean business, so watch out. Thanks for the free use of a copy machine. I can get the word around about this. Right. In other words, here's an anonymous fake letter that the FBI is going to send suggesting that right, the Communist International will be targeting the Sicilian Mafia, um, which right, is involved in things like the Teamsters Union. Um, this is a lie. Here's what the FBI says right internally. With respect to the above letter... It is a fact that three leaders of the Communist Party USA were in Budapest, Hungary in February and March 1968 to attend an international consultative meeting of communist and workers' parties, and accounts of their scheduled attendance appeared in newspaper articles. Two of these three leaders have since returned to the United States. However, the information in the letter that in Hungary it came up again about how his party is going to clean up the gangsters has no basis in fact. A few typing errors would also be inserted into this letter. Should the Bureau approve this letter for anonymous mailing, it'll be typed on commercial stationery, updated in Xerox copies of this letter, we made on blah, 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 right, and sent out. This is all a plot, right? Create dissent. Um, I mean, the FBI knows what the Sicilian Mafia does if they believe someone's coming after them, right? The effort here is to provoke the Mafia to retaliate violently uh, against members of the CPUSA. Um, right, there's no evidence that this actually works, uh, by the way, but it's not for lack of trying. Um, COINTELPRO CPUSA is also used to attack non-communist party political opponents. For example, a Unitarian minister and members of his congregation who circulated a petition against the House on American Activities Committee. A city council campaign of a lawyer who defended people prosecuted under the Smith Act, right, members, leaders of the Communist Party. When that lawyer runs for city council, the FBI attempts to smear him to sink his political campaign. This is not surveillance of violent threats. Uh, this is something different. The FBI will also then target the civil rights movement for African American rights in the years leading up to a formal COINTELPRO, which is COINTELPRO Black Liberation Movement, begun in 1967. The FBI began investigating the NAACP for communist links as early as 1941, finds nothing, nonetheless attempts to get the NAACP onto a list of subversive organizations in the 50s. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference are investigated for Communist Party links beginning in the late 1950s. Here are the things that prompt that. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech at the Highland Folk School, a social justice leadership training school accused of being a communist training center. Here's a billboard that floated around the South, right? Martin Luther King at Communist Training School. There he is. It's not a communist training school. Spoiler. Uh, right, but this billboard accusation is rooted in uh, an accurate history of the Communist Party in the 30s, especially supporting civil rights for African Americans. Now, they did that, of course, to further the party's interests and saw that as, as a great wedge issue. Um, but this is, right, hyping on this, this fear that will be spread by many segregationists um, that the civil rights movement is, in fact, a, a communist front being orchestrated by, by Moscow to uh, create social unrest in the United States. Martin Luther King Jr. sent a thank you letter to an ex-city councilman who happened to be a member of the Communist Party at some point because that person donated blood to King after he was stabbed in 1958. Uh, a member of the Socialist Workers' Party offered to join the SCLC as a clerk in its main office. I don't think he got the job. Hoover quietly tells congressmen, senators, and the Kennedys that lawyer and MLK advisor Stanley Levinson is a Communist Party member taking orders from Moscow. Um, he had left the party in the 1950s. All info on his membership that Hoover uses to make this accusation is over five years old. If you're in intelligence, you know that information that's over five years old is probably not very useful. It comes from two informants. That's it. The FBI, in fact, had attempted to recruit Levinson to be an informant, so how much of a threat can this person really be if the FBI thought they could turn him? Um, more importantly, there's absolutely no evidence at all that the Communist Party of the United States is influencing Levinson or King. Nonetheless, Hoover insists for years that King right, is a secretly a communist. Here's the head of the COINTELPRO operations, William Sullivan, shortly after the March on Washington and right, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. 
We must mark King now, if we have not before, as the most dangerous Negro in the future of this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro, and the national security. It may be unrealistic to limit our actions to legalistic proofs that would stand up in court or before congressional committees. Robert Kennedy approves wiretaps of King's home in the SCLC offices in the fall of 1963 after the March on Washington. The FBI will also tap King's hotel rooms, which Kennedy's maybe, maybe did not know about, unclear. In 1964, the FBI then goes after King by feeding tips to the press about his alleged communist ties and sexual proclivities, encourages the IRS to harass him and the SCLC. They find nothing untoward. Shortly after he is named the Nobel Prize winner in October of 1964, the FBI compiles a composite tape from King's hotel rooms of extramarital sexual encounters, um, the idea here is they send one tape to make it sound as though King is uh, having an extramarital affair with several women in this hotel room. It's just a composite of several different incidents in which this happened. Um, they send this tape to King anonymously with a letter. And jump around a little bit in this. King, in view of your low grade, this is from the FBI. King, in view of your low-grade, abnormal personal behavior, I will not dignify your name with either a mister or a reverend or a doctor, and your last name calls to mind only the type of king, such as King Henry VIII, and his countless acts of adultery and immoral conduct lower than that of a beast. King, look into your heart. You know you are a complete fraud and a great liability to all of us Negroes. Right? This is definitely dudes in the FBI. Uh, white people in this country have enough frauds of their own, but I am sure... They don't have one at this time that is anywhere near your equal. You are no clergyman and you know it. I repeat, you are a colossal fraud and an evil, vicious one at that. You could not believe in God and act as you do. Clearly, you don't believe in any personal moral principles. Uh, let's go down, right? Your filth, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. It is all there on the record, your sexual orgies. Listen to yourself, you filthy, abnormal animal. You are on the record. You have been on the record. All your adulterous acts, etc., etc. The American public, the church organizations that have been helping, Protestant, Catholic, and Jews, will know you for what you are, an evil, abnormal beast. So will others who have backed you. You are done. King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. You you are done. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. The FBI encourages Dr. Martin Luther King to kill himself uh, because he is such a threat to the nation in their view. The FBI offers this tape. King does not, obviously, kill himself. Um, the FBI then offers to turn this tape over to the press. Um, the press turns them down. Imagine such an era. And the FBI backs off in the face of a looming congressional investigation into electronic surveillance. Um, the timing of that works out in his favor, I suppose. From 1965 to 67, Lyndon Johnson right, takes over for the assassinated John F. Kennedy, clamps down on wiretapping, suggests it should be formally outlawed. Uh, there are a couple of Supreme Court cases, Burger v. New York and Katz, K-A-T-Z, versus United States, both in 1967. In these cases, the Supreme Court... Uh, changes its tune, says wiretaps have to follow the same procedures for a warrant. There must be probable cause. The people initiating the wiretap have to specify the crime they're investigating, specify the place to be searched, specify the conversations to be seized. In 1968, Congress follows suit, sets specific standards for obtaining wiretaps. This will not stop COINTELPRO overall, though. COINTELPRO will go on to target other confrontational political groups, including the Black Panther Party, which it helps to destroy with informants, misinformation, and violence. Um, and the American Indian Movement, which ends with a violent 1971 siege at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. The FBI will also go after the New Left and the Ku Klux Klan, successfully undermine both to some degree, which we'll talk about um, in our reading discussion. Then in 1975, Watergate. Revelations in the New York Times of government spying prompt the creation of a special congressional committee led by Senator Frank Church, Democrat from Idaho, to investigate the intelligence community. Um, someone managed to break into an FBI headquarters somewhere, um, grab a whole bunch of documents, and when they got back to their uh, little hidey hole, they realized they had all this COINTELPRO stuff, which nobody had ever heard of, and started leaking that to the press. Um, this also comes out in an era, right, where the Pentagon Papers have been released, proving that the government has known all along that the Vietnam War was largely hopeless. 
uh, and has been lying to the public about that for years. Um, there had basically been no major effort at intelligence reform prior to this, despite rumors that the FBI had data banks of U.S. citizens, had used information on members of Congress as blackmail for budgets and policies, and the occasional public screw-up, like the Bay of Pigs invasion, right, supported by the CIA. Uh, there are oversight committees in each chamber's armed services and appropriations committee, but they have clearly done nothing. Here's what the church committee discovers. It is a laundry list of awful things. Turns out the FBI had files on over 1 million Americans and investigated 500,000 of them from 1960 to 74, people who were suspected of subversion. That produced zero court convictions. The National Security Agency had investigated every cable sent or received by Americans overseas from 1947 to 75. The IRS allowed tax information to be used by intelligence agencies for political purposes. Lyndon Johnson had ordered the CIA to spy on anti-war protesters, believing that the Soviets or Chinese had to be behind it because he could not wrap his idea around, uh, his mind around the idea that American students were on their own so deeply opposed to his policies, particularly right when he'd thrown so much weight behind civil rights and the great society programs. It has to be the Soviets. It has to be the Chinese directing these students. This is a direct violation of the CIA's charter, which prohibits it from conducting domestic intelligence operations. The name of the operation, Operation Chaos. I mean, it's like they're not even trying to hide how nefarious this stuff is. Operation Chaos indexes 300,000 names with in-depth files and over 7,000 people. No evidence of foreign direction found for any of them. Um, not entirely related to our class, but nonetheless worth noting, Church Committee also reveals things like the CIA conducted drug experiments on unsuspecting U.S. citizens, infiltrated religious media and academic organizations in the United States, and participated in efforts to assassinate foreign political leaders, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. This was a gun that was supposed to give someone a heart attack if you shot him with it, so it looked like they had not been right, assassinated. Um, COINTELPRO, the revelation of these programs, is especially shocking to Congress because it's not spying. It's proactive counterintelligence. Um, the historical lesson here, if you want to draw one, anti-fascist and anti-communist paranoia of the early Cold War right, built this momentum that led to famously the Second Red Scare, the House on American Activities Committee, um, investigations, right, later McCarthyism. Right, it's all part of the same sort of spectrum. Um, but it doesn't end with McCarthy's sort of public downfall and the rollback of some of these laws that allowed, the pros allowed for the prosecution of Communist Party leaders. Instead, it carries through to the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 60s and the 70s. The ends justify the means in the government's view. Emblematic exchange between Senator Walter Mondale and the deputy director of the NSA regarding this collection of cable intelligence. Mondale, were you concerned about its legality? Buffum, legality? Mondale, whether it was legal. Buffum, in what sense? Whether that would have been a legal thing to do? Mondale, yes. Buffum, that particular aspect didn't enter into the discussion. Mondale, trying to give him another chance. I was asking if you were concerned about whether that would be legal and proper. Buffum, we didn't consider it at the time, no. Right? The threat seems so egregious that in the minds of these folks... Um, right, they'll just act to address the threat and deal with the legal consequences later. Um, even though, right, there turns out to be no evidence that, in fact, there was any nefarious plot by the Soviets or the Chinese to inspire anti-war protests, civil rights movement activities, and so forth. Yeah, Ryan. I was curious. Um, I was curious when you were talking about the FBI counterfeiting letters to MLK. What year was that? Sure, so that one is 64. It's right after he received the Nobel Peace Prize. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the results of this, of the Church Committee's investigations, um, on the legal side of it, this is prob the, probably the most important legacy is the establishment of a better degree of legis legislative checks on domestic and foreign intelligence agencies. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it is an improvement over what existed. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence is made permanent in 1976, House creates its own in 1977. This is opposed by the White House, by the intelligence community, um, by some government conservatives at the time, especially the hardcore anti-communist ones. Uh, they basically argued that this will cap the United States' ability to protect itself 
against all the threats that all those COINTELPRO operations never found. Church Committee counters that where intelligence agencies had violated the law, there were legal routes through which U.S. security objectives would have been met. In other words, the Church Committee argues that security and liberty are compatible. In 1978, Congress passes the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which creates a special court to secretly review wiretap requests against suspected foreign spies operating in the United States. Right, this is meant to draw a line between foreign and domestic spying. Right? Monitor threats while nonetheless protecting the civil liberties of American citizens. There's also a 10-year term limit placed on the FBI director. Right? Hoover is director from 1924 until he dies in 71. No more 48 years ours. Nonetheless, here we are because this doesn't entirely stop. In the 80s, the FBI investigates the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, subverts it. Those are folks opposed to Reagan's policies in Central America. The FBI spies on Occupy Wall Street. The FBI spies on Code Pink. They spy on Burning Man. Um, the terrorist attacks of September 2001, unsurprisingly, are a huge impetus to reboot this kind of program, right? Fear drives this, right? Fear drives this feeling that you must act regardless of the legal propriety of it, deal with the consequences later. The NSA, after September 11th, begins collecting the metadata of every phone call made in the United States, right, from major carriers, which is just like, who did you call? How long did you call them? What time? What date? Phone conversations, the actual transcripts, so long as someone is outside of the United States or involved in international terrorism, as far as the FISA court is concerned. Internet communications, now ostensibly, they're only supposed to be allowed to do this so long as one person is outside the United States, but inevitably, of course, domestic communications are collected too because you can't sort out, uh, there's no automatic way to sort out foreign and domestic internet traffic. It's the world that we live in. It's all interconnected. And what do you do when Apple servers are in Ireland, for example, right? Um, the NSA stuff is first reported in 2005, 2006, confirmed years later uh, with the revelation of the Snowden documents. There was a review of this broad data collection under George W. Bush uh, when revelations come out about the NSA's illegal wiretapping. Uh, Department of Justice determined it's illegal. And Bush decided to re-up it anyway, and only the threatened resignation of then-FBI Director Robert Mueller and acting Attorney General James Comey uh, keeps him from doing so. But the FISA court then just goes ahead and approves it. Now it's legal. Um, you want to look at the sort of cultural legacy of this? Um, I mean, the church committee comes at a time when people's suspicion of the government is through the roof. Um, Americans will never trust the government again. Uh, Right, this comes at the same time as the Pentagon Papers, at the same time as Watergate, and now it turns out the CIA has been spying on American citizens and attempting to murder foreigners, and the FBI has been infiltrating and destroying political dissident groups, including peace activists. Um, within the African American community specifically, you can certainly point to some things. Right, The suspicion that the FBI set up King to be assassinated in Memphis. Not that the FBI did it, but that they knew an assassination attempt was coming and chose to do nothing. Um, the suspicion that the CIA intentionally introduced heroin and then crack into the black community to destroy it from within. Um, whatever the evidence suggests, the reason there's so much suspicion in part is because the FBI did, in fact, infiltrate civil rights organizations and attempt to destroy them through nefarious, sometimes violent means. So, of course, that suspicion is there. Um, and yet, how uncomfortable and suspicious are we? when we carry tracking devices everywhere we go that always knows where you are. Soon this will be scanning your face. We want police to wear body cameras. Those cameras can be used to film our private residences. Taser, right? The company, Taser. Uh, Taser is like Kleenex, right? It's actually a company. Um, Taser is developing software so that police body cameras will soon have facial recognition software. So you'll scan your face here, and then police, as you walk down the street, see you, will know who you are. We use these. This tracks everywhere you've gone, every purchase you've made. Do you use a Metro card that tracks everywhere you've gone in the city? Fitness software that tracks how many steps you took knows where all those steps were. Now, on the one hand, some of this is, it, some of this is necessary. You want the police to be able to effectively police. Of course. 
Um, it would be instead. I, I, this is loaded very much. This lecture is loaded very much in a direction that is like no surveillance. But of course, there is necessity for it. Violent actors do exist in the world. Crimes very much take place. Some of this is innocuous. Um, it's good to track your health. Um, I enjoy personally receiving coupons from my grocery store that's based on the purchases that I've made. It's a little weird to know that they know what bagels I like or uh, you know what creamer I use. Nonetheless, it's awesome because that's then cheaper. Um, but someone is tracking all that stuff. And that's sort of the flip side of this is on the other hand, yes, some of this is innocuous. Yes, some of this is, is necessary um, and is actually advantageous to law enforcement that keeps us safe. On the other hand, though, this requires faith in the person who's at the switch. And that person who's at the switch now may not be the person who's at the switch the next administration around or 10 years down the road. I distinctly remember listening to um, uh, Bill Moyer's interview in 2007, 2008, when the NSA stuff was really in the, in the media and being kicked around. And this conservative legal scholar um, who was deeply opposed to what the NSA had been doing um, made this point, and it was... If you support what the George Bush administration is doing as a necessary action to keep us safe from the threat of terrorism, um, and again, I don't know how old you guys were, not very old, but I distinctly remember how frightening that period was um, when you just didn't quite know what was going on. I was a sophomore in college on September 11th, so I mean, it's, it's very, I definitely remember that period. His argument was that imagine, which then seemed the likely outcome, Hillary Clinton at the hands of that switch, right? The Clintons were the great bugaboo of of the right since the 90s when Bill Clinton was president. Hillary Clinton looked like she would be the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party. Um, And that was his argument, is you may support this now under George W. Bush, but then imagine Hillary Clinton having it. Um, And and you can expand this kind of thinking to other subjects as well. You might support, for example, the Obama administration's use of drones to target terrorists around the world, or suspected terrorists around the world. Right? You might think Obama has good judgment. Um, this prevent, prevents U.S. troops from having to go and risking their lives. It's quick and easy. Um, okay, if you supported the Obama administration and its use of that, I imagine you may not have voted for the current president, but he has the use of the same tool. And if you do support the current president, the next president that comes down the line, perhaps right, a more left-leaning Democratic candidate, who the heck knows what will happen, that person will have their hand on the switch. Um, this is the thing to think about, right? Don't only, it's easy in the moment to get sucked into the kind of the fear and the concerns that we have. Um, they are not always unfounded. They are not always unreasonable. But keep in mind the long-term effects. Once the genie is out of the box, it's tough to get it back in. No president is going to willingly surrender a tremendous amount of power. Government agencies don't do that either. Um, they just don't. That's not their nature. Do you subscribe to the notion that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear? Um, We will talk about those issues in our class discussion next time. Thanks, everybody.